This film is a guide to individuals, groups, schools and organisations that want to repair riparian ecosystems and give people access to the beautiful and dynamic natural environments along their rivers. It shows how a small group of landholders decided to repair their stretch of the Gawler River, returning it from the rabbit infested thicket of boxthorn and prickly pear to the diverse, beautiful and productive indigenous ecosystem that existed for thousands of years before European settlement. They had no idea how difficult a task they'd undertaken, but battled on, eventually being helped by dedicated and skilled seed collectors, natural resource managers, machinery operators, indigenous elders, local schools, conservation volunteers and students. The film presents some of the tricks of the trade that they've learned on the way, and looks at the way the Gawler community has brought its river back into their lives. The first thing that you really need to decide when you're going to restore a piece of river is what you are planning. What is it going to be used for? So is it going to be for the habitat of some rare species or several species? Is it going to be for a transport corridor, for a track or even motor transport? Uh, is it there for the general kind of rest restoration of the uh, the, the integrity of the river, so to prevent erosion, uh, it may have a role in preventing dryland salinity. Uh, it may be just a general kind of boost for the ecosystem. If it's anything like the Gawler River project, um, it'll tick a lot of those boxes. And once those boxes are ticked, you can actually choose the stakeholders who you need to engage in the project as sponsors or people that to be involved supplying mulch or any other goods. There hasn't been a lot done in the past, so uh, there's a big challenge ahead of everyone. So it's really important by uh, starting some of these projects that uh, we get the community involved. We need all, all hands on deck, as much help as we can get. To know what to plant on a site, you need to know what was there before Europeans really made this massive impact on our environment. Uh, and so it comes down to the climate, it comes down to floods, uh, infrastructure is important, what is actually there and what do you want to be there. Uh, there are things like um, transport corridors uh, which will have a huge influence on the way the project actually emerges. Finding out about things like fire, floods, etc. Uh, can be a bit tricky but old neighbours are wonderful when it comes to actually finding out what happened and uh, so they, they remember the extreme events very very vividly and can be uh, terrific allies. In terms of finding out about the exact species that were there, uh, quite often cemeteries and other little forgotten pieces of uh, the environment have got uh, tiny remnants of uh, species that were there but there are now also some excellent books and online resources which give you an idea of what was there uh, a long, long time ago. The Gawler River is an important landscape feature of the Adelaide Plain. Draining excess surface water and removing salt from the productive soils of the Barossa Valley and northern Adelaide Hills and providing a lifeline of green across the dry Adelaide Plain. The river gave the Gowna Aboriginal people a linear supermarket of food and drink on their journeys between the hills and coast with water, honey, ducks, acacia seed, wallabies, berries and tubers all the way. And for a while after settlement by Europeans, the river remained important for its water, enabling towns to spring up and providing water for stock and irrigation. But its water supply was somewhat unreliable and became increasingly erratic after reservoirs were established in the Adelaide Hills and native vegetation was cleared for grazing, causing rainwater to rush off the hills in quick floods rather than soaking into the ground and slowly being released into streams. The river ceased to be of economic interest with the arrival of horticulture along the Murray River and the development of boars on the Adelaide Plain. To get a, a scale plan is absolutely vital. If, if you can't draw it, you can't plant it and the whole thing could be a disaster. So, the easy thing to do today is get a really good aerial image. It can be straight down off the web using Nearmap or Google Earth. Uh, they've got a ruler tool, they've got an elevation tool so you can get rough contours. If you can get a, 
a really good contour map of the area that's, that's gold, but uh, quite often that's not completely necessary, but uh, it, it's certainly handy. You need to find out from council uh, if they have any plans for your area, uh, you know, what the zoning is, whether suddenly it's going to be covered with houses or there are major transport routes coming through, that sort of thing. Uh, in the case of this particular project, the Gawler River, uh, there's a plan for a bike hike track that comes right through along the southern bank of the Gawler River and, uh, and, and that means that we need to, to leave a seven metre wide uh, strip right through the middle of the planting and once you've got that general kind of uh, linear model you can start planning the individual plantings uh, and, and things get quite a bit easier. In general, we like to plant from the human access point, whether it's a path or a road, outwards. And it would be small plants like uh, grasses, uh, ground covers and that sort of thing through further back to the shrubs and the trees. And this gives a, a really good feel to the landscape. Restoring a river is a huge project, so you can use all the friends you can get. Um, so you do need to have a, a big picture, which you can enthuse people with. Uh, you, you need to budget, and you need to map things out in terms of stages, so that people aren't overwhelmed by the enormity of the thing, but they, they see that they can chew off this bit and then that bit, and once they've done that successfully, you've really got a, got a good tight group working on the project. The Gawler River Restoration Group's been particularly lucky to be in a region serviced by the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges Natural Resources Management Board, which rates catchment care very highly, so we've had a lot of help from the board as well as other partners. Each group aiming to repair their river will need to assess what the landholders can provide, as well as fundraising and scouting around for assistance, whether it be in kind, financial, in materials or perhaps even training. We, we do actually um, provide incentives to landholders and uh, um, that's mainly if the landholder actually contributes themselves as well to complement that. We, we try and target or aim for a 50-50 basis but that's quite uh, a lot of the time quite un unachievable by the landholder. So then we, we look at the importance of the project and weigh up whether we need to tip more in from our department and, and they do a, maybe a little bit more input through um, just physical labour themselves. There is potential there as well from local government and state government departments who seem to be getting on board more and also um, contributing above what we put in as well. This is happening more uh, as the com more of the community get involved. I think it is worth having an incorporated group or a group that stands up by itself uh, and, and speaks for the river. I think that's uh, helpful and that uh, through its structure it protects the people who are involved from uh, all sorts of liabilities and it absolutely ensures that they are covered for accidents and that sort of thing. The main aim of my job is to build community awareness of environmental issues on a local level and to build the community's capacity and their skills to live more sustainable lives. So the Natural Resource Centre raises funds through both community and state government grants and also get funds from corporate bodies and we also um, raise funds through plant sales from local nurseries, local provenance nurseries in the district. When a new group starts with um, with the NRM board, um, with the Community Group Action Program, they register for insurance for safety purposes um, and also undertake training in hazard ID safety plan so that they can identify the hazards on the site um, and safely look after themselves and their volunteers. Um, and then from there, uh, the group, um, I sit down with them and work out uh, what sort of activities they'd like to do on their site, whether it's river restoration or weed control or whatever it is that they want to do. and. Um, 
Once we've mapped out the kind of activities they're interested in doing, uh, we take that work plan to um, council and then get council to approve and find out if they can provide support in funding or mulch or tree guards or whatever it is that they can provide. On Clean Up Australia Day, we actually got the Brossa uh, Four Drive Club involved in removing a whole heap of tyres that had ended up in the Gawler River. They were an absolute eyesore and we thought it was a good first step to um, repairing the river and um, they were extremely helpful. They were there for a whole day and we got out hundreds of tyres, ended up with a whole mountain of tyres at the end of it that the council were um, kind enough to take away and it just made a, a huge visual impact on the river so people could then see the potential to make it a nicer place. There's nothing worse than having a project all set to go and no suitable plants. So it's very important to get locally indigenous plants and we've been very fortunate here that we have seed collectors working the Gawler River and propagating locally indigenous plants. Uh, we've been uh, help, helped by them enormously and it's meant that we haven't had to chase around to nurseries all over the place for these rather rare provenance forms of, of different native vegetation. So uh, get the plants ordered in good time. You can always hold them in a nursery, uh, but if they're not ready, uh, you certainly can't plant them. In terms of um, the plant structures and the plant species that are important along the river system, uh, some of the information that we've collected is based on historical records and some of it's based obviously on just um, surveying and actually checking out what's happening there. Um, along the river reserves in Gawler there's probably about 150 native plant species that we've identified to date which is a fairly high number but there would be some additional species that are missing from that, some of the softer species that just get eaten out or uh, don't survive well with grazing. Our um, uh, database of plants is is been made up over the years from a number of surveys and things and then we go into the process of plant uh, propagation which involves mostly seed collection and growing from seed we do a little bit from cuttings but that's uh, well it's much more difficult than growing from seed normally and uh, but important for a few species to do that so we've had a number of projects over that 15 year period that have involved revegetation and weed control and removal of a lot of the big woody weeds that have got pepper trees and things, uh, ash trees and things like that that have tended to take over some of the areas of the river. So that's actually opened it up because one of the historic features of the river was that it was fairly open uh, canopy and understory in the river, not heavily um, you know, vegetated with shrubs and, and uh, that sort of layer of plants so, and that's an important uh, feature in terms of thinking about how to do revegetation as well is not to put too much in the way of you know, shrubby type vegetation in because that suffers a lot when a flood comes through. The places where you're going to find the best sources of uh, what's been happening are along some of the roadsides, some of the steeper um, banks of the rivers where you know, there's been grazing but no cultivation and uh, you know, odd little patches of old water reserves or crown land that have you know, sometimes some quarry type land that's uh, been left relatively untouched over the years. Several grasses, uh, grass species that are located in Gawler here that you can't find for quite some distance around. So through seed collection we can produce dozens of plants each year potentially. It's a bit hard to be too sure about the role of individual species but I think you can be pretty sure that if you can produce a good range of species you're going to help a lot in building up that biodiversity amongst fauna. I mean you've got insects, butterflies, birds, lizards, they all need a good range of uh, food supply and over the 12 months of the year as well so you know we have a bit of a boom in uh, you know, winter and spring with some of the species but those species that flower or or seed in summer and autumn, they're obviously key species that we're looking to, to make sure they're uh, part of our plantings. Well, before you start rushing around with your tube stock and planting it, you need good site preparation. 
this will pay for all of the time and care you put into it. The first thing is access and we'll need to get four wheel drives and possibly heavier machinery into most of the situations along the Gawler River in order to get this woody weed problem under control. These are, are big trees like peppercorns, smaller trees like uh, wild olives. They all put up quite a fight. In this project, the root systems of pest plants were left in the ground to provide temporary soil stabilisation while replacement plants became established. The heart of the operation was a 15 tonne excavator fitted with a vertical grab and with a highly skilled operator. The grab had been retrofitted with a blade such that branches and small trees could be chopped into easily handled and stacked piles. The reach, stability and hydraulic power of the machine combined with the manoeuvrability of the vertical grab enabled extreme power to be exerted if required or the execution of quite delicate operations in other situations. The bulk of the small branches were stacked into strategically located heaps which were allowed to dry for some months before burning. The large branches and logs were moved away from the channel area where they could have been washed back into the river and possibly caused damage to infrastructure or formed log jams. Instead they became wildlife habitat on higher ground. The ash from burning heaps was used as a potassium rich fertiliser in nearby horticultural and broad acre farming operations. Taking excessive fertility from the alluvial soil near the channel is of great competitive benefit to the native plant species to be re-established. Flexible work groups were provided by the contractor, meaning that the excavator may work alone for a day and then be assisted by staff with chainsaws and herbicide application equipment to take off tree stumps and kill root systems of species such as African boxthorn, peppercorn tree and wild olive. The stumps need to be treated with herbicide immediately after they've been cut in order for effective absorption to occur. Shallow channels are carved into the cambial area of the trunk to enhance the effect of the biocide. Trees outside the channel area of the river were able to be treated with herbicides containing triclopa and plants in or very near the water received a relatively environmentally benign form of glyphosate. Two or three operators also work particularly effectively together where the trees need to be removed from areas outside the excavator's reach, using a saw to fell the trees and ropes or chains to apply tension and ultimately pull the tree up and out of the channel. Some of the pest plants require special treatment. Prickly pear should be stem injected with triclopper based herbicide in the warmer months, some months before removal. The removal of some large woody weeds poses a threat to buildings or valuable vegetation. Top down removal in stages may be required and in this case access issues meant that tree climbing was necessary. Getting the first safety rope high into the tree was done by the traditional string and rock method and after that it was easy, well, for a very experienced operator. Once they have been removed, uh, you'll need a follow-up because they may re-sprout uh, and then finally you can really get stuck into the herb um, weed layer and uh, the biggest problem here along the Gawler River is soursop, also known as oxalis. It comes up from a powerful bulb and it just covers all of its competing vegetation with lush growth during the autumn. Uh, now, there is one particular chemical which seems to have been 
you know, quite okay to, to, to selectively control sour salt. Metsulfuron methyl, uh, and, uh, and so used very carefully and sparingly, it can give you a relatively clean seed bed to, to actually plant into and save an awful lot of follow-up work. Another thing you can do about sour sob is to plant species that simply do grow taller than sour sob or species like Atroplex semibicata which just smothers it. It's an incredible prostrate grower. Another, another thing that can be against your natives compared with exotic weeds is excess fertility and so to actually take a hay crop or in some way remove fertility to the site is of advantage. Some sites just do have a high population of rabbits and possibly hares, um, very frustrating and um, generally some violent activity needs to occur and um, uh, there's nothing wrong with rabbit pie I can tell you. One of the things that uh, again needs to be thought about um, in preparing a site is to make sure that if there are livestock in the area that it is fenced off, uh, particularly the British breeds of sheep and goats are uh, absolutely rapacious and so just don't even think about planting trees until appropriate fencing is there. If you've got a lot of uh, wallabies and kangaroos uh, again you, you, you need to think about the way that that's going to be controlled in terms of appropriate fencing or other tactics. I think we leave projects too early. We say, okay, we've done two or three years of weed control and we walk away from it. Uh, we do some re-vegging between, obviously, but um, I believe uh, our project should be monitored for weed control up to seven years. Uh, especially along river systems, we've got good fertile soils and there's also a lot bigger chance of transport of weeds through river systems. So I try and encourage landholders that, um, uh, along river systems, don't look at a one, two or three year project, look at a ten year project. A lot of groups will dig their own holes, but in some cases uh, hole boring uh, in advance is done. Uh, so you really need someone who has clearly in their mind what the planting plan is. We along the Gawler River find that uh, we're planting all year round. It's just the way our group works and we do have access to good irrigation water. So we've adopted a technique that they pioneered in Alice Springs and Broken Hill where spasmodic irrigation can be applied uh, for a long period of the planting's life. So it, it emulates a, a summer thunderstorm uh, every so often. Uh, we wouldn't be irrigating it like fruit trees. Uh, we would perhaps be irrigating about once every month or two if there hadn't been natural rainfall. So the irrigation is terrific for, uh, for, for establishing young trees and then you can also use it for this follow-up to keep your vegetation ticking away through even the longest drought. Well once your trees are in the ground, and just make sure they don't get, get planted too deep, um, uh, they really need to be protected and we use uh, a jute matting uh, as a weed mat and, uh, and then in most of our plantings use sheet mulching which involves newspaper essentially between all of the matting. Uh, it needs to be about four sheets thick uh, and essentially you've just mulched out any other weed, weed growth. Uh, and that will enable you to really reduce the amount of herbicide that's used uh, in your project. A, a lot of our volunteers really dislike seeing herbicides used and, uh, and of course it's a very sensitive environment along the river so uh, we'll do everything we can to avoid herbicides if possible. We have um, so many people volunteering here, um, whole schools, roll up and, uh, and so again a good reason not to use herbicides. Um, 
and they're very vigorous uh, and they particularly love you know spreading the woody mulch around the trees and making it look all natural in one go so it's that satisfaction of really seeing what was kind of this weedy landscape converted into something that really looks like a manicured garden you know at the end of the day's work it's uh, tremendously satisfying I'm afraid there will always be a few weeds that sneak through and uh, hand weeding and possibly even a bit of spot spraying uh, will be required to maintain control of your, your site, particularly the first couple of years when your plants are very little. Um, so it's just something that you have to do. It's not something people particularly like, although we have one volunteer who just finds it so therapeutic to, to come weeding. Hydromulching is a revegetation technique used to quickly stabilise sloping sterile soil exposed by major earthworks in mining and road building. It was used to treat the banks of an old loam pit next to the river from which loam had been mined many years ago. Hydromulching is best done during the rainy season and to avoid erosion it's best done immediately after the earthworks. But first the soursob and other pest plant species inhabiting the banks had to be eliminated. They were sprayed with a systemic herbicide to provide a weed-free environment. A fortnight later, the pest plants have started to die off and earth mover Tim Schmidt is on the job early. He's chosen a battering bucket for the work, carefully scraping and shaping the banks to reduce their slope and remove loose organic matter. His excavator has limited reach and accuracy, so at the tops of the banks where the hydromulching will articulate with existing revegetation, some manual clearing of trash is required. Tim piles up the spoil to use in another part of the project. Meanwhile, Alan Matheson has arrived with his spray rig and is filling its mixing tank with water, shredded newspaper collected by a community group, and seed donated by a local revegetation specialist. The seed was selected from grasses and salt bushes to provide habitat for native creatures, stabilise the site and withstand the occasional flood. Some sterile rye corn seed is also included in the mix. Well, for standard job native seeding we would use um, between 5 and 12 kilos per hectare of clean seed and we would also generally put in a cover crop which is a sterile rye and we usually put that in at the rate of 5 kilos per hectare. That's just to germinate quickly uh, and establish um, some stabilisation to the area while the natives are waiting for the conditions before they germinate. So it yeah. comes, comes up the first year, dies off in yeah. summer, and then just that's the end of it. So, and by then the natives are coming through. Another important ingredient is the glue, which dries to stabilise the seed-rich papier-mâché in the face of wind and rain. A cold front is closing in rapidly from the west and there's no time to lose if the glue is to have it six hours to dry properly before rainfall. The 70 metre hose easily reaches the whole site and Alan begins the task of steadily building up a 10 millimetre layer of hydromulch over the banks. He goes over the site two or three times to avoid runoff and build the seedbed. A green dye in the mix makes it easy to see how much material has been applied. The hydromulching has turned out to be quite a quick process and Alan has virtually caught up to Tim in spraying almost a thousand square metres in less than an hour. The cold front arrives that evening and 50 mils of rain fall steadily over several days. But the hydromulch resists erosion and a week later the first shoots of new growth appear. The rye corn is first out of the blocks quickly turning from a copper colour to a vibrant green. Some of the native species are close behind it and in a fortnight there are up to 50 plants per square metre. The floor of the loam pit is subject to fairly regular inundation and will be planted particularly with sedges and other plants adapted to flooding. It'll be one of the areas constantly invaded by waterborne weeds like California burr and castor oil bush, so plantings will be dense. With the revegetation well underway, this log jam built up in the channel during 2010 and erosion of the south bank happened extraordinarily quickly, undermining both the boundary fence of the food forest and the plans for a public path along the south bank. The group explored options for the removal of the five metre high weir of logs and with another flood threatening, a 30 tonne excavator was shipped in. 
the aim being to remove and burn the massive logs before they could be washed back into the river and cause the same problem downstream. First, some truly monstrous logs were retrieved from the jam and built into a primitive wharf onto which the machine was driven and was able to reach the far part of the blockage. Log after log was fed into a hot fire and despite rain and increasing river levels, the blockage was successfully removed, restoring the river to its normal channel just in time. A surging river for the following weeks could have caused a massive bank collapse. Ultimately, there was a meeting between the Gawler Council, a local natural resource management staff, a special river care officer with the regional NRM board and the adjacent landholders to look at the repair of the riverbank. The council took the project management role and a local water engineering firm provided a plan for the earthworks involving over 1,300 tonnes of earth fill and a tow of rock beaching to protect the restored bank from the major force of the river as it swings out around the bend. The landowner next door arranged to let the earth moving contractor through his sanctuary fences to undertake the rebuilding of the bank and also provided water for compaction purposes. The process first involved cleaning up the unstable edges of the erosion with a large excavator and mixing the dry soil with moister soil. Ultimately it all needed to be moistened to achieve an appropriate level of compaction. Meanwhile, truckload after truckload of unwanted subsoil from a nearby urban development project were dumped at the site, got a bit of a drink before being pushed into the big black hole in the riverbank. Water was also poured into that gaping cavity. The excavator operator mixed the soil and methodically built the base of the repair. As his machine rose higher in the hole, he swapped the digging and mixing bucket for a sheep's foot roller from time to time to compact the soil. 1,300 tonnes is a lot of dirt to squash. With the foundation established, it was battered to the right angle. Then some trenches were dug to key in the tons of rock beaching. A layer of geotextile was further protection from erosion undercutting the beaching. This rock armour would be placed to a height of about four metres above the riverbed. Above that, the compacted soil and the vegetation to be planted on it would have to keep the new bank stable. Truckloads of rock started to arrive from a local quarry and were dropped from the top of the bank into a basin from which the excavator grabbed and placed them as beaching. With the base of the repair complete, soil was spread over the beaching so that plants could be established on it. Soil had been stockpiled while the stone was being laid and was brought to the site by a loader as well as more trucks. Bucket loads like this were dropped into the hole for days for spreading and compaction. Everyone was wondering how the excavator was actually going to escape from the hole it was filling, but ultimately it dug its way through the top of the bank and completed shaping the repair from the top. Before he left, the earth mover added fill along the top of the bank east of the erosion damage to enable a safe public walking track to be built, completing a vital section of the trail along the south bank of the river. To help things along, council staff helped to spread jute matting to stabilise the bank and keep weed seeds at bay, and also to reduce evaporation and soil temperature. The jute was anchored to the soil with wire staples. Revegetation on the plastic clay subsoil donated the project was going to be a hell of a job, and it was clear that nothing would survive without drip irrigation. So an inline dripper system was installed as a horizontal network carried by fencing wire anchored by stakes at each side and at the centre of the area. The dripper line was attached to the wires by electrical cable ties and water came from the next door fruit block. The planting plan for the site was divided into eight zones determined by how frequently the plants at a particular level on the bank would be flooded. Zones 1 and 2 being frequently flooded and subject to long periods of inundation. Zone 3 flooded annually. Zone 4 inundated about every five years, but not for more than a week or two at a time. Through to Zone 8, which is at the top of the bank and is essentially never flooded. 
Locally indigenous plants were chosen for each level and planted randomly such that species that turned out to be well adapted to the soil and water regime would populate the whole site. Assessment of the most successful species for such revenge work will be carried out over the next 10 years. Plants were sourced from the Environment and Heritage Association and hundreds of flood adapted plants were also donated by local commercial revegetation business Ecodynamics. Planting had to be done on an extremely uncomfortable slope, but the local group was bolstered by volunteers from Chile, Italy and Germany and made steady progress, chopping holes through the jute matting downhill of each drip point and planting the tube stock. A nagging doubt was the possibility of the loose soil spread over the compacted foundation delaminating and sliding down slope. The group didn't have long to wait and the first rain was a solid 50 millimetres over a few days. A few sections of soil slid, but the displaced plants were given access to light by making new holes in the jute and hardwood stakes were driven into the site to better bind the top layer of soil to the foundation. The river flowed really vigorously in the following weeks and there was erosion of loose soil placed over part of the rock beaching. A netting strip to lock the leading edge of the jute to the soil had to be installed. And it was sorely tested in a later high river, but overall the design worked well and the plants flourished. 18 months later, the bank remained stable and the plant community was doing well. The most successful species are asserting themselves and providing a guide to other restoration work along the river. Revegetation of riparian flats is tricky because of frequent flooding, the constant arrival of debris and weed seeds from upstream, and the relatively fertile and often moist soils that suit exotic plants. Such areas can become veritable jungles full of trash and landholders often graze stock on them to control the pest plants. Unfortunately, thorny, poisonous and unpalatable plants become the ultimate survivors and do well as a result of the manure of the stock. The water's fouled and habitat for native species is destroyed. This floodway was actually created by loam mining which destroyed the river bank and allowed high rivers to take a shortcut thanks to the removal of hundreds of thousands of tonnes of soil for suburban gardens. A canopy of red gums had survived the mining but the indigenous understory was almost completely absent. So the challenge was to revegetate the area with native understory species that enjoy being flooded from time to time, won't choke the river with bushy vegetation and provide habitat for indigenous fauna. <laughs> to quickly get a grasp of the site and reduce the smaller exotic shrubs and trees to a mulch, a groomer was attached to a 14 tonne excavator. It's essentially a hydraulically powered mulching mower with fixed teeth whizzing around an axle. A groomer annihilates almost anything but is particularly effective in controlling prickly pear as it grinds the pads to a paste, destroying their capacity to take root. With the site reasonably clear, the excavator was refitted with a vertical grab to remove the larger exotic trees. The roots were left in the ground to help soil stability. A ground crew quickly followed the grab, chainsawing the residual stumps and applying herbicide to prevent regrowth. Wood and foliage was heat for burning, creating the bonus of fertiliser for a nearby farm. and with the landscape more visible and with a bucket on the excavator it was possible to create access routes for maintenance vehicles and fill some of the dangerous holes left by the mining operation with equally random heaps of soil left in the landscape. At the outset vehicle access would have been impossible even with a four-wheel drive. The bucket also enabled the removal of tyres half buried in the silt. The site had been significantly transformed. Despite the bonfire and grooming of the area, it was still littered with large pieces of wood, rubbish and tyres which would make maintenance with conventional tractor mounted mowers impossible. 
So a four ton excavator with grab, rake and blade was used to clean up the site. The speed, accuracy and efficiency achieved by the operator was extremely impressive. To help handle the heavy trash on the site, there were also machines from a local farmer and an earth mover as well as a rented dump truck. The dump truck was also used to cart away well over 150 tyres. They were to be recycled and the biggest one weighed in at over a quarter of a tonne. With winter bearing down, it was likely that the disturbed site could be eroded by a high river and send troublesome amounts of silt into the stream. So a cover crop was planted by one of the members of the group using a broadcaster on the lumpy site. The crop quickly germinated and the grass had grown sufficiently to withstand four floodings that went over the area in a matter of weeks. It had created stabilising root systems in the soil and went on to compete actively with weeds brought down by the river. Interestingly, the native reeds that had been flattened in the clean-up operation shot vigorously through the cover crop, enjoying the extra light allowed by the removal of the woody weeds. In spring, the cover crop was mown along with regrowth from weed species. Revegetation on the site will commence in the next autumn, mainly using sedges, reeds, lignum and other species adapted to ephemerally flooded sites. It will contribute to cleaner water entering the ocean and provide habitat for indigenous creatures. In the meandering of a river, it'll probably pass through some reasonably soft soil and erode a deep channel, particularly on the outer bank of a curve, where it will particularly tend to erode, possibly leading to cliff formation and steady collapse of banks into the channel. Whilst this is a natural process, it can lead to the destruction of natural resources and other assets. Use of plants that form mats over the soft soil and species whose roots bind it together can slow this process and provide habitat at the same time. In this project, part of the north bank of the Gawler River was targeted for revegetation. Working on the almost sheer cliffs was going to be difficult. The group needed experienced chainsaw operators with specialised skills in the use of safety ropes, as well as machinery to extract the woody weed vegetation from the channel as it was filled. It would be hard to involve most of our community volunteers. But in one part of the area, the cliffs had slumped to the point that nimble volunteers could be involved with planting. Another flattish part had been used as an informal hard fill dump amongst the jungle of woody weeds. This section was a real mess, but was potentially the most accessible part of the North Bank to the public, being at the end of a road. Help came from the Regional Council, who blocked off unauthorised vehicle access for dumping and provided support to boost a grant the community group had already been awarded for the revegetation project. This potential park site was cleared using an excavator equipped with a vertical grab and the group followed up with woody weed control. From the park, it was possible to construct an all-weather ramp to enable access right up to the cliff top. You can see the steady removal of pest plants over the whole site in these aerial photos. The local community could also see that a lot of effort was going into their river access point and were soon walking along the cliff top and down to the river at their park to be. Revegetation was also revving up with Conservation Volunteers Australia chipping in with lots of vigour. Along the cliff top, the property owners backing onto the project area have taken ownership of the native grassland and one has provided access to mains water for irrigating the newly established native plantings. Another has offered part of his land for addition to the publicly accessible nature reserve. Most of the work on the cliffs has been done by rope savvy professionals, painstakingly chainsawing and removing pest plants from the channel bank. In stage two of the project, it's planned to use 
more strategic tube stock planting and hydro mulching. The combined goodwill and power of a community to tackle projects like this particular one has been really heartwarming. The group has had help from the councils, the adjacent landholders and many others. They have been given truckloads of mulch and the contractors have been fantastically generous with their time and skills, going way beyond the extra mile to make the project happen. Continued support from the Natural Resources Management Board has been central to the success of the whole venture. It really is important to show the progress of your project to backers and, and your supporters generally uh, and photo points are the ideal way of doing those. So it, you're taking the photo of a particular scene again and again and over time you can see this transformation occur. But equally important are the censuses of uh, birds, uh, of uh, macroinvertebrates uh, in, the, in the actual water body and also um, frogs and that sort of thing. So these are things that you need to record and have available to people just to show that you're, you're not just you know, having success with your plants, you're changing the whole ecosystem. So of course there's more to the river than just the native plants. They're really the building blocks for the natural biodiversity of the region. And um, in my opinion, the, the interesting <laughs> side of it, the, the birds and the butterflies, and of course the stuff that lives within the river, in the water body. And so, the Natural Resource Centre organised a native fish essay workshop and invited members of the community to come down to the river and see what uh, aquatic life exists in the river. We were lucky enough to catch some of these wonderful little native fish and they included the flat-headed gudgeon and the little common galaxis and we also caught some yabbies in the net. So it's, it's wonderful to see that they have hung on to life and they're still there. Yes, one of the things that uh, has been a challenge with the river system particularly is the blockages in the river that, that restrict particularly native fish moving up and down the river system. There's several species that require to move, you know, breed in the uh, marine waters and then move back into fresh water. So the, this weir that uh, was just below the river junction in Gawler was a, a massive problem with uh, fish get, being able to get back into the more permanent uh, water holes around Gawler and further upstream. So the removal of that uh, a few years ago was a big uh, uh, step forward really. So those fish now have access into pretty permanent water holes once you get into Gawler and, and further upstream. With, with the general ecosystem in the rivers, the level of flow in the rivers now is much reduced compared to what it was you know, 100 years or more ago. The big impacts are farm dams in the North Para and the big water reservoirs in the South Para and to a lesser extent uh, farm dams. Um, the, the level of water flow, it's not essential that we go back to the sort of high levels of water flow from previous years, but it's very important that the extent or the number of months of the year where water flow occurs is extended because of the life cycles of a number of the uh, you know, small animals that rely on the river system for their breeding cycles. If the water time of water flows is cut short then they won't uh, breed up well and that then of course re removes the uh, food supply for all the other animals up higher up in the food chain. Our rivers across the Adelaide Plain are just about invisible. They, 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 you know, you're over them in a flash as you go over a bridge and, and we've got to get them into people's consciousness. So not only do we need to do the work, we need to show what's happening and we need to get the public to come and use the rivers, whether it's for just a walk or a cycle or a picnic or to launch some canoes. It's the people that you need to, the community that you need to engage. And once you've done that, you can feel pretty confident that you'll continue to get support for your project. I would love to see government organisations um, invest heavily into environmental works. Um, 
because what we've got left is so, so little, there's really not much left. So what we've got we need to maintain and look after and we need to expand those areas too. On a personal level, I was a little bit disheartened when I first um, bought the property that backed onto the Gawler River because I spent a lot of time growing up along rivers in my childhood and um, it was a wonderful place to go and learn about the environment and I found when I was taking my daughter for a walk along the river that it was really difficult to find some native plants to point out to her. It was just surrounded by weeds so I didn't want her to think that that's as good as it gets. I wanted her to know that we can actually bring back the native plants and animals and um, make it a nicer place for everyone. To minimise property damage from floods and to maximise biodiversity and recreational benefits, the Gawler Council has been acquiring land along the river for many years, with the Natural Resources Management Board and Gawler Environment Heritage Association, slabs of riparian land have been cleared of pest plants and revegetated. Walking and bike paths were constructed to use the river corridor for recreation and non-motor transport, but getting safely across town remained difficult because of its rivers and railway lines. In 2010, Council received support from the Commonwealth Government for a bold plan to build low-level bridges that would be temporarily submerged in the most extreme floods, but would essentially link the different parts of the town. Four strategic sites were chosen and they were joined by a high-quality bike-hike path network. Gawler, previously divided by three rivers and two railway tracks, is now cleverly joined by these low-level bridges and a network of six kilometres of new bitumen tracks which also serve to give the public access to the river. The trail network and bridges also give a spatial framework for the task of revegetation and a series of strategically placed interpretation signs which bring to life the history and ecology of the river, enabling residents and visitors to understand the riparian landscape and the creatures that live in it. This new bridge enables people from four previously separated neighbourhoods to easily walk or ride to visit each other and to access the town's major sporting and community centres as well as the primary school and the town centre. So many people now are actually understanding and seeing parts of the river that they've never seen, been able to see before. And it's also, of course, a, a good um, sort of transport connections through, through Gawler, which is you know, limited because of the a small number of bridges across the river, but also just a great recreational asset for people getting out and about. And it's, it's fantastic the number of people are using it now. So I think over the next few years we're going to see these uh, paths extended and I think that will be fantastic. In the future it is the State Government's intention to link the Gawler Path Network with the Barossa Valley and two major bike paths from Adelaide as well as the path from Gawler to the sea. Users of those paths may one day find themselves passing through one of the most beautifully revegetated stretches of the Gawler River thanks to good planning and effective collaboration. <laughs>